Good morning. Thank you, John. Um, it's a tall task to try to talk about what's going on in the economy, and uh, especially given the political landscape and the changes that are happening every single day. Like even last Friday, we had a major surprise where the inflation rate actually in uh, what they call the PC index went below 3% for the first time in a couple of years. And the chances of a better economy uh, look positive, but there are other things here going on that might change that. So today, we're going to try to explain what's going on, what we think is going to happen, and what other people think. What does it matter what I think? It's what you think and what other people think that drives the economy. Um, I had a couple of headlines. One is political deja vu. I, I don't think anyone thought a few years ago we would be where we are, but here we are. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, there's an awful lot of geopolitical tension, what's going on in the Red Sea, the Ukrainian war, what's going on in Israel and the Gaza, uh, and an endless amount of spending, federal policy, and other actions going on by our government. So the big question is, are we going to have a soft landing, or are we going to have uh, a recession, or even a hard landing? And I'll explain what those things are. But everyone pretty, pretty much knows what a recession looks like. But we will touch base on what a hard landing would look like, which is a low possibility, but still exists. So just a quick thing about my firm. The firm's been around forever, 133 years. Uh, we, we have clients, we, we talk about clients from a partnership perspective. We're partners with our clients. We have a lot of clients that have been with us for an extremely long period of time. We're a mid-sized firm, but honestly, when I started, we were about a $20 million firm. Now it's $350 million. I can't even believe it. The number of people has gone from 125 to 1,700. Uh, actual professionals with about 240 partners. So it's almost unrecognizable to me, but it's been a thrill to be there. And it's a great place to work. We even still have picnics and Christmas parties, and I think those have almost gone away. But, you know, playing some beanbag game, even, even we, have, we have an office that I run in India, and they even took up the mantra with that, and they, they were playing these games you know, and, and they videoed it and sent it back to me. It was pretty thrilling. But we, we don't lose people, and I think that's not a mistake. We all have a problem with maintaining our people, and that's super important. Um, as far as uh, the business that you're all in, uh, we have dedicated teams. Uh, we have clients around the U.S., uh, and we really try to tailor our practice, and in particular, M&A, uh, our core is, of course, assurance and tax, but we have other consulting services. Um, we try to put out thought leadership to explain our thoughts as to where things are going, and maybe after this we'll have to send something out about the economy, but that depends on how well I'm received here today. Um, so inflation and the money supply, how big a problem do we have? Uh, we've gone from 9.1% consumer price inflation, which everyone feels in their pocketbook, and now it's at 2.9 as of last Friday. The core rates uh, aren't quite as high, uh, so in other words, the commodity prices, food and energy, uh, are a bigger factor in an inflationary environment, but now you know, we're coming down to 4%, and just slightly below 4%, that's still not very good. That's above growth levels, which means we're going backwards, and most people can't afford a 4% inflation hit into their pocketbook. Um, we've had now seven periods, if you look at the, all the way to the right, seven periods of big inflation blips. The biggest one uh, was in my youth, uh, which was around the, uh, the war in, uh, you know, we had the two Arab wars followed by 
uh, Paul Volcker raising interest rates up into the high teens. And I remember buying, as, as I was in the markets in those days, buying uh, long bonds, which are 30-year bonds, at a 20% yield. That's insane. Here we are. We're all complaining about the fact that you know, long yields are at 45 or mortgage rates at 7 or 8%. That's nothing relative to those days. So if things get out of hand, they're really bad, and that's a hard landing. So what causes inflation? Too much money chasing too few goods. We saw that in particular because of supply chain issues, and we really felt that pull of not enough goods available. And I'm sure in your business, if you wanted to source supplies, I unfortunately invested in some oil wells in Texas, and I incessantly heard about the fact that we were losing money because there were no drills or there were no other things. And what also happens is sometimes there's more compliance than we would like. And I'll discuss that a little bit later, but more compliance creates more constraints, which creates more issues. Uh, I had a professor named Eli Schwartz when I went to Lehigh University, and he had a great little formula, consumption or what everyone spends, plus investment. So what we put into goods and services that basically engineers and others create, those are investments. And government spending, and we'll spend some time about government spending, less taxes, because taxes take money out. That's our GDP. So the levels of spending and consumption really impact the growth and the robustness of the economy. And if we don't pay attention to these, they can get out of control. So if the economy's good, they call it the Goldilocks economy, GDP and money supply are in balance. That's a non-inflationary scenario. But the money supply, which it did, got way, way ahead of any activity that was going on. And growth and consumption was out of control. And this is where we get inflation, and that's what happened. So how does this happen? Well, how do you grow the money supply? So people have to borrow, or the government has to borrow. So if we are the government borrow, then money comes into the economy. If it doesn't get taken out, then we have a problem because there's too much money chasing too few goods. The money supply comes back in when you repay debt. And we're in a scenario now where we're going to have to repay debt. And I'll get really into this in a little bit. So credit in the economy, how much money is available matters, and it really impacts what happens on a daily basis? What type of rate do I pay on my equity line at home? Or what type of rate do we pay in our businesses to finance our working capital or our work? Like as an accounting firm, our work, we don't get paid until people pay us. So therefore, we have to borrow. And in particular, around the tax times is brutal for us. So some quick things, deflation. Simplistically, prices are going down. Recession, we have at least two quarters of negative GDP. We haven't seen that, and everyone's wondering why. Why no recession? And a depression is what happened in the 30s, but everyone was worried in 07 and 08 that we were going there. So how do we control this? Fiscal policy sets and the government sets the mandate for how much money gets spent. They also set the mandate on what happens with that money, where it's spent. It's supposed to be specifically earmarked, but we increasingly see that money is spent on things we necessarily didn't set it to be in the rules. So people aren't strictly following the rules as they used to from a government spending perspective. And that creates, of course, if we spend more and we 
put more money into the system, we have a deficit. Only during the Clinton period in the 90s did we have a surplus. But if we spent the same amount of money, we have a balanced budget. So how do budgets contribute? So we effectively spend more money, but we lend money to the government. So how does this get covered? So there are primary dealers in securities. So the Federal Reserve and the Treasury decide that we're going to issue so many bonds and the primary dealers need to take these up, the big banks. And they are the buyer of last resort also. And so therefore, if there are too many bonds and too much money that is needed, interest rates go up and long-term interest rates go up. And we are in a period of that. It isn't serious yet, but it could be. So what happens at the Federal Reserve? The Federal Reserve has really two mandates. One is stable prices, and that's CPI, PCE. The other one is full employment. That's a strange push-pull type scenario. How do we deal with full employment when we have to stabilize prices because everyone wants to spend money or put money in the system to keep it all going? So there are two major things that the Federal Reserve can do. They can control the money supply. And the way they do that is through their interest rate policy and also quantitative measures, otherwise known as quantitative easing in this last period of time. That's a Bernanke term. Uh, and quantitative easing is putting money into the system. I lost my screen, I'm sorry. So the Fed owns the government, is owned by the government effectively, even though it's independent, and it lends to itself. Well, that's a pretty nice scenario, isn't it? You know, you borrow money as a person and you lend it back to yourself, and you'd figure out what interest rate you charge. So that's, that it sounds a little rigged, doesn't it? But, you know, simply they're printing money, and that's the problem. As they print money, what happens? The cost of goods and services go up if we consume. So this is a balancing act. How do we balance inflation and unemployment? And this is sort of the yin and yang of monetary policy. So we have to have government debt, and we have a balance sheet. The Federal Reserve has a balance sheet. So if they want to monetize debt, that's a term, monetize debt, what do they do? So now, instead of just putting it into the system, they buy it back. They buy the debt from the dealers, and they stimulate by putting the money to the dealers, and this is quantitative easing. And the problem with that is you're, if you put too much money into the system, then there, you've grown the money supply. There was almost like a thousand time growth in the money supply. And now we're in a period where we're going to have to contract the money supply. So you can imagine what that's going to do. So can we print money indefinitely? No way. Because we have two things going for us. One is we're considered to be the reserve currency for the world. So if we devalue our currency and others lose faith and confidence in it, then A, we will have higher interest rates, and B, uh, we will potentially collapse the dollar. So your purchasing power for anything that's imported would go through the roof. This happened two times in Argentina, and they just had a new uh, president elected where they decided they're going to follow the dollar. And that's the most strict measure they could possibly use. But it's the only way they could control the money supply. So increasing the money supply, though, creates inflation. And if you have inflation, you have serious problems, as we all know. So from a historic perspective, uh, we had the, the Great Depression, of course, and no one can remember that. No one's probably, or almost no one's still alive that remembers the Depression. 
And then we have the pandemic after we had the 0708 crisis. So in 0708, what did the Federal Reserve do? Because it, the, you, we need to look at that history to figure out where we are. Well, just like they did in 0708, where they moved interest rates to zero, zero, we got back up to about two and a half percent. And then they decided the pandemic was here and they needed to go back to zero again. So now when people were selling bonds, they were trading at somewhere around one and a half percent. I mean, it's hard to believe, right? One and a half percent. And in Germany, the bonds were a negative yield. Why would you buy a bond at a negative yield? That makes no sense whatsoever. So we got ourselves into a position of, in my opinion, idiocy. When I looked at this, I used to be a bond trader. I sold every bond I had, and I thought, well, this is like Christmas time, isn't it? I get to sell these at a profit, but then there's, what do you invest in? There's nothing to invest in because interest rates are zero. I bought some equities. I was lucky. Maybe good. I don't know. I was lucky, probably. So we had the pandemic stimulus during the pandemic in 2020. After the, this great recession that we had, now we have too much money. There's all this money coming into the system. And what happened? Well, under Trump, there was about two and a half trillion dollars of debt issued. And then under Biden, it's about another five. So that's seven and a half billion. What happened to that? That's, that's the question. What happened to that money? Well, I'm sad to say we only saved two billion. We didn't pay off any debt. We added to debt, right? So no government savings, government spending. So we saved two trillion. So that means we consumed five trillion dollars in either government spending projects or on ourselves. And some of it went on to the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, but now the Federal Reserve needs to liquidate that balance sheet. So just like we said, even though we put this money into the system and we were consuming, there weren't enough goods, we had inflation, the price of things, goods and services, went up. They've gone down some, but it's mostly in commodity prices. Oil, gas are very low right now, even though we've had this blip because of the Red Sea situation with the Houthis. Uh, and we have the stimulus out there. So what, what's really going on? Well, commodity prices have come down and inflation has come down, but we all know wages have not come down and we're having a hard time finding people to even work for us. So some people are going overseas. If you have government projects, you're not going overseas. You can't do that. So you have to hire people. Where are these people? And therefore, we're, not, we're at almost full employment, if not at full employment, and we have still 4% inflation. I mean, just some anecdotals. I'll give you some. Um, the S&P K. Schiller National Home Price Index uh, is up 42%. Everyone's working remotely, have a hard time getting people into the office. Uh, Rolex watch, there's a watch index, and it's at eight, it was up 86%, now it's only up 28%, you know, since the pandemic. Price of things are still high. Uh, vehicles, you know, used vehicles, up 60%, now only up 36%. So we're retracing, but we're still at very high levels. How, ha how have we done on inflation? How would we rate ourselves as a country? Well, the Federal Reserve so far has done a terrible job in the early part of this, moving rates to zero, keeping them there too long, not getting rid of some of their balance sheet. And people have a real problem with that, especially people in the markets. But in, the, in this last year, they jammed rates up faster than anyone has ever done it. They got them to 4.5% at the end you know, of 22, but now they're at 
five and a quarter, five and a half. And they're talking about them being sticky. Well, that's a problem, right? If, if they keep rates high, what's going to happen? So the markets anticipate about four rate cuts this year, maybe after last Friday, maybe back up to five. But what is going to go on? How do we rate the government in their spending policies? Well, that's got to be an F. You know, the, some of the spending was probably required in order to keep things going during the pandemic. But after that, why, why are we piling on like this? And there are new and further bills, which we'll talk about later. So what are we going to expect now? Are we going to have a soft landing? What is a soft landing? A soft landing means, it doesn't mean that we don't go into, you know, sort of like a slowdown period. It just means that things will get back in line and the Federal Reserve has a 2% target. So we'll try to get to a 2% target and maybe they keep rates higher throughout most of this year, but then rates start to come down. That doesn't mean that long rates and mortgages will come down, and that's very important to all of you. So what does Goldman Sachs say? They think there's going to be a soft landing. We see continued disinflation as the economic growth and the labor market remain robust. And to 24, there's growing optimism about a soft landing. JP Morgan, I could see a scenario where the Fed is on hold, rates for all next year, would be unprecedentedly high. Forecasting a scenario of moderate rate cuts and mostly by the end of the year. UBS, the Department of Labor uh, has data on job openings, quits, hires, layoffs, suggest a soft landing may be near. But what if the, the market remains tight? Fidelity, soft landing would allow investors to lean on higher risk assets and invest and not worry about inflation. And growth stocks, real estate, and cyclical credits are a good thing to do. Bank of America is sort of in the same camp. There are people who don't think so. Uh, Barclays and Citibank think that a hard landing is possible. So we go all the way from a soft landing to a hard landing and a hard landing, high interest rates, low growth, high borrowing, and maybe the government doesn't have the ability to cut rates or the economy would collapse because there's no ability to borrow. So what does history tell us? History says we're pointing towards a soft landing, but a hard landing is possible. And we've seen that when we had runaway inflation. Those inflation levels that you saw were followed by hard landings, those spikes, and we had the spike. So inflation drives wages. And when wages become inflated and cannot go down, it becomes embedded in the economy. And we have this mentality about more inflation. That is the big worry. So the yield curve is just something simple. The Federal Reserve rate is at the shortest end, and right now that's at five and a quarter. And then the long end of the market is the yield curve, and those rates are below five and a quarter. So the yield curve is inverted. This always points to an, a recession normally. And it just is a lag factor of about 18 months, and we're starting to get into that time period. So I don't think the all clear signal is here. And the debt levels leave very room for any further fiscal spending. You can just see it by the fighting that is going on in the House of Representatives. It's not just political. There are real opinions here about the fact that we can't borrow any more money. So the good news is 75% think that we have a soft landing. The economy will be more like a interest rate of three and three and a half percent. That's all good for spending, for housing, for all types of things. And inflation gets back to maybe like two and a half. Getting down to two is hard. 
Um, the stock market will probably remain robust, but that's all dependent on earnings. And earnings at the sort of the, you know, we're all at the supply chain level. We're either goods or services, in this case, services. If services remain good, which they are right now, then things will probably be okay because that percolates up. So the Fed has telegraphed, like I said before, four rate cuts. That would be a good thing. So let's talk a little bit about the industry here. So this is like Yogi Berra, deja vu all over again. You know, are we going to have, is there going to be a surprise in the next four or five months and someone else is running? Or are we gonna have Trump, Biden all over again? You know, people in their 80s running the country, but with very different ideas about, especially the economy and the way social activity is run. So, what do we get out of this? Um, hang on one second, sorry. So, the, if we have a Biden administration again, we probably have something similar to what we see right now. More government spending, more compliance, probably some inflation, higher interest rates, and the continuation of the Inflation Reduction Act and basically spending on, let's call it the Green Initiative, which we'll touch base on. Um, so on a Trump administration, probably something almost the opposite, probably lo slightly lower interest rates. The guy still likes to spend, so it's not gonna be way down. Uh, interest rates will go down a little bit. Uh, we probably will have a little less inflation, but not a lot. But our borrowing levels are still at $34 trillion. So the only way out of this is to grow our way out of this. You have to grow really substantially. So the CBOE, which monitors these things, thinks that we could grow our way out of this, but we're going to be in a difficult period for probably four or five years. Um, just to go sort of more along the lines of what you're all witnessing, you still have backlogs of work. We have backlogs of work. There's still a need for people and work. But we have to remember, we've been spending somewhere between 30 and 25% of our GDP growth through government spending. So there needs to be, per that old formula, a contraction of GDP from the public sector and it needs to be picked up by the private sector. That's pretty hard to pull off. So I'm tempering what I'm saying here because I can't just go all in on a soft landing. I think we will have a soft landing, but it won't feel great. It's not gonna feel like we're coming out the other side. And the stock market is already built in a lot. So infrastructure through the end of this year, I don't think you have a problem. They're still gonna spend money. We're going into the election. Election years are normally pretty positive unless there's some catastrophic event, which could occur. So, you know, what happens in Israel? It looks like it's hopefully nearing the end of this bit of it, but now there are tensions in, you know, with Iran. We're talking about whether or not, in order to open the Red Sea, that we're gonna have further warfare-like activity. So what goes on, though, at the heart of this with developers, construction? I mean, I used to be a developer myself after my career in Wall Street. And when interest rates go up, the question is, can I get a return that exceeds the level of inflation that I have to spend over this project and my returns need to be substantial. You know, I would want somewhere between 12 and 15% returns. So if we start to see the projects not being very attractive, then that's a point of time to worry. 
that things are not going to go the way we want them to go. So I don't see long-term rates coming down given the things we talked about, inflation, staying sort of about 4%, and the, the fact that we need to borrow money and the Federal Reserve is now taking money in quantitative tightening. So we've never, they have seven and a half billion dollars to work off. Some of it can go where the bonds just redeem, but then more of it starts to happen as we go further into the cycle. So there are headwinds. I don't want you to believe that this is just a clear sailing path. You know, you hear Jamie Dimon talk and he's always very tempered and he is probably the guy who knows more about what's going on than anybody else. The regional banking crisis was a blow to all of us uh, because, A, you know, that, those are the lenders on commercial projects and commercial real estate. So maybe the, the business has been righted, but they still own all these long securities, and they own them at pretty bad levels, like maybe two and a half, three percent. Don't ask me why they were buying at two and a half to three percent, but you know, clearly they didn't have some good economic forecasting going on. So we have to worry, I don't think about the banking system too much, but we do have to worry that money is tighter than we've seen it for a while. The inflation and the Fed is going to do their thing and they're going to lower rates, but we need to make sure we don't spend too much. Uh, we have almost target inflation, and that's a good thing. If we could keep it in this 2% level, that will really help all of us a lot. But will the government be willing to do that? Because there seems to be a big disconnect between Main Street and Wall Street. Developers remain cautious from the ones I've been speaking to, and it's going to take a while in our region here in the, in the Northeast to get people off the dime to do new projects. So the question you have to ask, are we at the inflation trough or are we just going to start going the other way? And normally, in this stage of the cycle, long-term rates come down, but I don't think that's really gonna happen. Sorry about this, the clicker's a little sensitive. So what do you all face as challenges? The biggest challenge is talent. And let's face it, a lot of us are getting older, including me, and are the new people gonna pick up the mantle? And are they going to work as hard? And are they gonna fill in the gap? And do they have the professional skills to make this all work? And education is really under scrutiny right now, so that lowest generation is a concern, and we need to really turn that around, and it's not just about spending money. New ideas need to come in. So we always talk about, you know, where are we? We're all little and professional businesses slow to change. I think the pandemic really got us into a different place. Remote work became the thing. And is that going to work? And I think that was perfect commentary from the last panel that communication and working with the people and being that, that set of leaders, not just the top leaders, of course it has to come from the top, but the leaders at that partner principal level is critical to make things work and to motivate people. And, you know, there are gonna be new tools. Like, there'll be things like, you know, you'll, you'll have your almost like avatar workers on some screen and you can see them and what they're doing, but it's not about that, it's about spending time. So you need to get them in that either virtual office or someplace else and talk to them about their lives and their careers. And, you know, these days, every two weeks we have a little thing, it's social, it's like for an hour we talk about what each one of us are doing and what's going on in our lives. And it's not like the old days of going out to lunch and talking to people and that type of thing. 
So to me, that is the utmost importance of what we do. Succession planning is critical. I'm now in my second two and a half years of phasing, and I have probably like another half a year to go before I, they, they either put me out to pasture or I decide I want to keep working. I don't know. I, I pretty much love golf. So I'm spending a lot of time on the golf course these days, and my handicap's looking pretty good, but I'm getting up there. So how many more years do I have to do this? I'm, I'm going to spend a lot of time out of the office. So how do we make that change? We need to be great at our succession planning and make sure the people coming up from behind are going to be able to carry the mantle. Not like us, but in a different way. So let's just talk a little bit about M&A activity here. Clearly, we're in a consolidation phase. My firm didn't get to 350 million in revenue by just, you know, inert growth. We were basically buying smaller firms for the specific areas that we need to grow the business in the areas we want to grow. And so I, I'm like the outlier. I didn't buy any financial services business. We just grew it and it did great, but you know, it's hard to grow without doing some acquisitions. And so there are a lot of acquisitions that are going on and continuing to be done, and that's probably a good thing, but it does shrink competition, uh, and maybe that's good, you know, if there's too much capacity. So in the short run, more mergers will probably occur. And 24 will probably be a good year for this because there's a lot of optimism right this second. Multiples have gone up, so it's a good time to sell. So I don't think my firm's selling, but you never know. And so therefore, you need to keep your eyes open, and then the PE industry has figured out that we're like cash flow machines, so they will continue to look to buy firms and to do roll-ups. I'm sorry, it's a little small, so I'll just talk to you about it. Uh, there's an act that is on the table, but it hasn't passed. And the reason it probably hasn't passed was there was a section in there about the, the way we're doing immigration. Tax Relief for Workers and Families Act is 100% put together, but it doesn't look now like it might pass like it did a week ago but maybe they'll be able to come to some understanding, but the administration doesn't want to give in on this. So that would be a shame, but you know, we know that the you know, R&D amortization is going to be pushed out to uh, the beginning of 2026, but is that now going to happen? I don't know. It's, every day is sort of like a new question mark. Section 179D benefits expanded for 2023. The ability to be able to write things off and the Inflation Reduction Act, I want to talk about in a little more detail. But, you know, those are good things for this industry, and they're good things for us at my firm. So I also run our sustainability ESG program, and we've renamed it. It's now going to be called the Practical Sustainability and ESG. Now, what, why, what is going on here? I've studied this a lot. We have an international firm on this. We have people around the globe and then in the US. Basically, Europe, I don't know if they've gone crazy, but they have, they have things about in waste and plastics, which I think could be done. Imports, where they will charge import taxes for goods and services that have high levels of emissions. They have a new act about social things, which looks like that's an appropriate thing. But when you add all these things up and the need to disclose in your financial statements, suddenly there is so much compliance required, you wonder if European companies can even be economical anymore. 
And that has flowed over into California, where the California Emissions Act has come out. And if you're doing business, not if you're in California, but you're doing business in California, you're going to have to report scope one, two, and three emissions. Scope one is basically, you know, buying energy. Scope two is, you know, the measurement of the use of energy through, let's say, you know, you, you're building, uh, you're, you're basically leasing a building, and then what is, what is the specific either direct cost or computer cost? And then finally, your suppliers and what they are using in emissions and in CO2 metrics. So A, you're going to have to measure your metrics, and B, you're going to have to report on your metrics. And we keep moving in this vein where we think we're going to, and I'm going to get very specific in a second about this area. If we're moving to where we have to report on this, and we think that we can get to zero emissions by 2030, then that means we need to basically electrify the country. How the heck are we going to do that? The, the electric grid is not sustainable if we go up more than maybe another 15 to 20 percent. And the amount of renewable energy is way too insufficient. So the practical answer is probably we need fossil fuels for at least the 2050. And based upon that, the ability to get to zero inflation by 2030 is impossible. So how does that relate to us right here? New York has been very keen about electrification. And think of those ramifications. Municipalities, electrifying your buses, your buildings, you know, you're probably on natural gas or some other form, your police, fire, I mean, these are huge costs. So we might want to move in that direction, but we might not be able to move in that direction. So we need some practical answers. And now we have things like the, we all know the sea levels are rising and that we have melting and that we have flooding that is beyond our expectations. And so there are projects in Boston and New York and probably starting in Philadelphia where what are we going to do about this? How are we going to deal with this? I've seen plans in Boston where basically they're planning on around the seaport to raise the seaport by roughly 20 feet to deal with this problem. But if we really have this problem continuing for a 10 or 15 year period, the flooding will be way worse than that and it will change our lives. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't focus on CO2, I'm just saying that we need to focus on some of those ramifications. And that has ramifications on levels of borrowing cost in risk areas. So it's going to become very hard to borrow in Florida when you have issues associated with your mortgages. And that's true in general on the Eastern Seaboard. So all these factors are coming to play. And even if you don't believe that CO2 is the whole answer, we still have a period that we have to deal with where we're in a, a warming cycle. My, my father was a weather scientist and before he died he told me, Mark, I've done the math, this doesn't work, but he said you better not create a hole in Brazil. Well, there's a hole in Brazil right now. So there are things going on that the world needs to pay attention to. And we just have to sort of go with it. So change is the norm. And we have to deal with that norm. So I hope um, I, I'm here to answer some questions. I think I have some more time. But I hope you have some idea of where we might be going. I mean, I, because I had to put my money where my mouth was, my mouth was as a career, I try to come to con some conclusions. So I, I, I'm not the authority, but I hope I gave you 
a good idea of where things are going and where and why. And that's basically just a common sense approach to what's going on. But the world is very complex and the US is in a state of flux. And I don't think it's just political. I think it's because people don't know what direction to go and therefore they're trying to figure out what's the best answer. And the best answer would be somebody 45 years old, but I don't think that's gonna happen. So um, does anyone have any questions or want some clarification? So th thanks very much and uh, have a great day.